So I've covered a lot of content on working with Qmixes. I've covered why you should consider working with separate Qmixes. I've covered how to work with Qmixes. But one thing that I've been pretty um, straightforward and upfront about is I always make sure that I talk about my specific setup when I'm talking about Qmixes. What do I mean by that? I use a quantum system. I use a, a main quantum aggregated with a quantum 4848. It has a lot of different inputs and outputs set up with it. And the main reason I use the quantum is its stability at incredibly low latencies in terms of the buffer sizes. So at a device block size of 32 samples with, with a medium dropout protection, I'm getting 2.5 milliseconds of round trip latency. Now that's with the dropout protection, which is like an additional buffer. The actual input latency is 0.83 and the output latency is 1.0. So that's like 1.8, but I can drop it down even further. I can go to 16 samples and then at a medium dropout protection, my round trip latency is 1.5 milliseconds. Now I've tried this on a medium session with some virtual instruments and lots of tracks that I can track at 16 samples without any dropouts, without any clicks or anything like that. That being said, when you get that low, it can actually cause phasing issues with the singer where it sounds weird and you have to start flipping or inverting the polarity of their own signal because it sounds out of phase with what, with what they're hearing in their actual head. So most of the time, my system stays locked at 32 samples with the dropout protection set to medium, 2.5 milliseconds of round trip latency, and I'm laughing. Now, this would be just me setting something up and listening to the main outs and, and whatever I'm listening to is what the artist is listening to. But let's, for a moment, let's set up some different tracks over here. Okay, if I take a look at these tracks, let's say that the artist at any given point in time says, I want to hear something different. In my outputs, I have two Q mixes. I have QA and QB. QA is the spit if It goes out the spit if of the main quantum and it goes into a controller. The controller has a digital to analog converter and then I can route the headphones that are going into that vocal booth behind me. So I'm using that as my main uh, headphone send that goes to that vocal booth. And then I also have another cue set up over here, which goes out to a headphone amp that's on the couch that's behind me there, where often band members or a producer will be sitting and he'll kind of like he or she will be giving feedback to the artists that, that are in the booth. So, but I, I need to make it clear that when I talk about creating cue mixes, that I'm 100% talking about a software based setup where you are listening entirely through the DAW, right? That is a big difference between working this way, which I honestly prefer. It's so much easier for me to just manage one set of software. And then the most I need to do is if I do decide that I need a queue, we could just activate it, apply and okay. That it by default is linked to any of the channels that I make an adjustment to which is kind of, I think, the, a good behavior to have. And for the most part, that's what you want. And then if I need to unlink it, I can actually unlock these and then I can make separate adjustments so the artist can have something different than I'm listening to. But quite often, I notice in the comment section, whenever I do a video to do with Qmixes, that it always comes up where people are saying, like, I have an Apollo or I have uh, an RME or a Focusrite or perhaps a, a 32 uh, a Personas 32 Live or, or a 64, like these are big boards with lots of inputs and outputs and stuff like that. At that point, I always usually say the same thing. I don't think I would work the same way if I was working with a big board like that. I don't necessarily think that I would work the same way. Even when I'm working with an Apollo, I don't work the same way. Let's take a look at the Apollo software just for a moment. I'm going to go open up console. If we take a look at console, if I swapped over to the Apollo, um, we have basically a full front end mixing system. And what this is, is a software based low latency monitoring mixer. Whether you're using, using Universal Audio, Focusrite, uh, I know a lot of great stuff from um, Audient, um, the Persona stuff even. I will show you the Studio 192. It's the same thing over here. Here's Here's my Studio 192. I have different inputs 
the actual DAW return is coming down one pipeline. So whatever's coming out of the main outs, it's going to come in this one fader. And then all of the live inputs, I could balance against that fader if I wanted to. Let me move this back. And also, same thing here. If I was using the Apollo, my main DAW outs would be coming here. And then I could actually balance everything else against this. And then, of course, when we are record enabling our tracks in our DAW, regardless of whether you're using Studio One, Pro Tools, Logic, we're not actually monitoring them. We're just record enabling them because the monitoring is happening in the lowest possible latency path and it's happening through a software-based low latency monitoring mixer. What this means is that it just finds the quickest path. So it will just directly route an input directly to the outputs and it won't pass it through the whole entire signal chain. It's not going to go through plugins and different processing in your DAW and then make the whole entire round trip and come back. So when I talk about working with QMixes, I need to be clear that I'm talking about when doing software monitoring, where I'm plugging an input into the quantum in this particular case. It's going through the analog to digital converters. It goes into the DAW. I might be listening through uh, a whole entire effects chain on the actual channel itself or maybe just one plugin. I might be using additional sends like reverbs and delays. All of that processing is being done within the DAW. And then that gets sent out the main outs and then it goes through another conversion process where it goes from digital back into analog. And then I'm hearing it either on headphones or on speakers or the artist or the producer or whoever's listening. Now, with respect to Q-mixes, when I think about working with Q-mixes in the context of like um, how I like to work, it is very much a software-based workflow, meaning that it's entirely through the DAW. I'm only managing the DAW as the application. All the levels, everything is being managed from within here. Now, when you talk about working with QMixes and setting up QMixes, I'm not saying that you cannot do that with a Studio Live series board or an Apollo or anything for that matter. What I am saying, though, is that if you take a look at the round trip latency of, for example, an Apollo, which has the incredible ability to let me track through really high end plugins with virtually, I won't say zero latency, but virtually indistinguishable latency that I could track through like a Neve modeled, you know, um, channel strip with a preamp. And then I could go into some compression and maybe some EQ and I could actually print that on the way in. I'm not, I'm, the, the latency is negligible or it's very, very low. It's, it's, and it's a really, it's a really nice tracking experience. But if I was to set up Q mixes and alternate outputs and be listening through the actual software, it wouldn't be the same. So for example, I have a feeling that an Apollo is probably, I don't know the exact math, but if I had to guess, I'd say it's probably between uh, maybe like 1.5 and 3 milliseconds of round trip latency. That's my guess. And this is obviously depends on if you're, if you're stacking different plugins on top of it, unison plugins. That's a pretty nice tracking experience when you're listening to that low of latency. But I bet you that you would hit the 7 milliseconds to 12 milliseconds of round trip latency if you were using it in software monitoring. Now, to wrap this up and bring this back to what I was saying, when you talk about QMixes specifically, the way that I see it and the way that I use them, I'm very much using them as faders. I'm very much using them the same way if I had a mixer and it had a send. When I first got my first mixer, I had two sends and one of them was uh, one of them had the ability to be pre-fader. And they weren't faders, they were little knobs and there was no marks for zero or whatever. And you had to create headphone mixes and I had everything routed through a patch bay and I had a headphone amp that had two different channels that it accepted, two stereo inputs that it would accept. And I had to create sends for everything if I wanted to create an actual headphone mix for somebody that was different than the main outs. Now, that's the way I think about working it with digital gear and when I'm doing software monitoring. But that doesn't mean that QMixes can't be used with things like Studio Live series boards and 32 channel, 64 channel, or Apollos or anything like that. You just have to be aware because some of them might allow you to have multiple different streams. So for example, what do I mean by that? I've never set this up this way, 
and I don't know if this is just borrowed over, and I've never had a, uh, uh, it's been so long since I've had a Studio Live series board connected to Universal Control and this newer version. But for example, you have different DAW faders. I have one main fader. So if I use the Studio 192 as my interface and I play my main outs and I open up a session, the whole stereo mix is going to come down this fader. But you do have different low latency monitoring mixers from different applications where you might have multiple faders like over here. Um, and it's the same thing in the, where is it here? In the Universal Audio one here, the console application, you have Virtual 1, 2, Virtual 3, 4. You can actually route different things in. So you could use QMixes to create, for example, a click track. You could send all of your click to an additional input on your software mixer so that the click is coming in for everybody here. And then from this channel, then you would dial up your sends and you would say like, okay, how much click do I want everybody to have? If I've got three or four different people listening, okay, this person, this person, you know what I mean? You could do that type of thing. It really depends on the, on the software mixer and the type of functionality that's been built in, right? Because in a lot of cases, if I take a look at, let me look at my app, Apogee Boom. Uh, in this case, right, it's very simple. You know, I have my two inputs and then I've got playback one, two, playback three, four. So there, there is a couple things in terms of like, I could use some Q mixes and I could create a Q mix send as long as the routing is available in my IO matrix. I could create a Q mix send where I could send something like the click track out and then I could toggle between the different mixes and I could set something up that's different for different people. But in general, when you're talking about QMixes, I think if I had a choice and I was working that way, I would most likely be doing a lot of that directly from the board and I'd be managing, um, I'd be managing the actual mixes as much as possible. Like let's say that I got this mix and I was happy with it, then I might right click over here, I might right click and we have the ability to like copy mix and then I could come over here and I could paste the mix. So we could get to starting points, but this is one of the, I guess, you know, it's like a, it's not really like a bad thing. I don't see it as a bad thing. It's not even really, it's not even really pros and cons. It's just that if you're working with, with um, certain interfaces that come with a really well-designed and well bit low latency monitoring mixer that's in the software domain, like a lot of interfaces have, then you have the ability to track with with next to no latency, like almost zero latency. And then of course you have the benefit that you could you could be sitting with a very busy session and then you could set your device block size rather high. You'd be putting zero strain on your computer. This also allows you to work with older systems. Now, like I said, with how it wraps into QMixes, it really depends on how many channels or how many faders that you have available in the low latency monitoring mixware and the software side, how many different like virtual faders that come up. If you have potentially four or eight different faders, then you could just, you could kind of create subgroups of different tracks and send them to faders. And then from the actual mixing application, you, once you set that up in studio one, maybe it's part of your template, um, you would actually be creating the mixes, not necessarily from within Studio One, but you would just be managing the software application itself, which in some cases can be very easy. And in other cases, uh, I know that, for example, there are different apps that can be downloaded where people can control, you, you can give them control and permissions. People can control their own mix entirely. So if they wanted to hear more click, less click, more drums, less bass, that you, they basically just have a fader that could be associated with that. Now there's other things like DCAs and stuff, but I don't want to get overly complicated. But what I really wanted to do here is just kind of like iron out any potential misunderstanding or miscommunication. And I would just come out and say that for the most part, anytime I would be using an interface like an Apollo, like a like a big board from Personas, like um, uh, RME stuff or things like that, I, I would definitely be taking advantage of the low latency monitoring that's available uh, from within the actual mixers that are that are well built. I would I would use Q mixes at that point only to send like groups of things, maybe click tracks and like very simple things like that. But I, I would 100% be doing most of my monitoring through the actual console applications. And there would be no monitoring like 
doing anything like that. It would just be simply making sure that I've record arms of the track, but I don't, I don't need to hear the double processing of listening to the low latency monitoring mix plus listening to it going through the entire DAW. So that's how I would approach Q mixes with boards. If I had a Studio Live board or something like that, I would actually explore it further, but I'm sure there's some great video content from other Studio Live users and Personas has some great content for working with the Studio Live boards and stuff and more specifically managing Q mixes. Anyways, I hope that helps. I'll catch you in the next video. Cheers.